recall, we had uh, finished off last week with this slide. We were talking about three types of adaptations to cold stress. Habituation being a desensitization of the normal responses. And then metabolic adaptations, which um, primarily were characterized by this beijing of white adipose, the induction of brown fat. And brown fat was the metabolically active fat that can waste the energy that you use to make the uh, gradient in the mitochondria. It might be used for weight loss. Um, not a great idea for doing work, but certainly good for keeping the body warm. And we had described this overall uh, idea that cold might be the cue which makes this switch occur. And oddly enough, exercise also has uh, branches within this schematic where it does something similar. It can also make these beige cells or transform existing uh, adipocytes into more metabolically active adipocytes. So there's some really interesting crossover between just shivering and being cold and the responses to exercise, which may or may not be somewhat counterintuitive. <clears throat> so we're going to take a look today at the types of procedures and some research that investigates this response, cold and the induction of brown fat, the metabolic activity of, uh, of fat tissue. I'll start with what looks like a, a typical procedure. This would be how the stress was applied in the lab. And this is periodic stress over four weeks, which isn't a lot. <coughs> After this week, we have four uh, weeks left in the semester. But you might feel this pass a bit more slowly, even though the semester passes pretty slowly already. This is two hours per day of cold exposure from four days a week to five days a week at 10 degrees Celsius. 10 degrees Celsius, not unlike walking into a hockey rink. Maybe 6 to 11 degrees at ice level. <coughs> Sitting there for two hours every day of the week. Now this acclimatize, or sorry, this acclimation protocol, I suppose, if it's um, in the lab, is bracketed by experimental sessions, and this could be whatever you want to test. In this study, we're going to look at the results coming up. This is um, what the experimental session looked like, a lead-in period followed by cold stress to see how the body responds to uh, the stressor to which you're adapting. They're measuring EMG to see if the uh, muscle activity or the muscle tone changes, skin and core temperature. And uh, really unique and new to this section are these glucose and fat tracer infusions. These allow you to observe from the outside of the body the metabolic activity of a tissue. Because these labeled tracers glow or can be easily picked out by a, a sensor outside the body, you can see when they, uh, they are taken up by a tissue and when they're metabolized. So we get a good sense of tissue metabolic activity and you might even make um, overall indirect calorimetry measures which is just what we do in, uh, in the lab across the street when you wear the mask. We collect all the expired gas. That's indirect calorimetry. So these are candidate types of measurements that are used in this study. We'll come back to this study eventually. But what does this type of repeated cold exposure over four or six weeks do? At a whole body level, <clears throat> this is after six weeks, so a longer stimulus, we get the sense that something's going on because fat mass goes down. And this is a pretty measurable, robust change for individuals that were in this cold acclimatized group, or cold acclimated group, versus a control. We see a loss of two-thirds of a kilogram of body fat. So something's going on where fat mass is lower. And I wonder if that is appropriate. Wouldn't you think that if you were chronically exposed to cold, you'd want to insulate yourself? Wouldn't you want to retain more fat mass? Shouldn't that insulate you and keep you warm? We see the exact opposite. 
And the amount of fat mass uh, that you lose is correlated with the activity of brown fat in the body. So if you're not keeping extra fat mass around, and you're losing insulation just by having extra tissue, at least you have this enhanced ability to increase the activity of that tissue, the heat generating capacity of that tissue. So six weeks related to um, brown adipose activity, and we see that shown over here. If you have a larger change in brown adipose activity on the right-hand side of the x-axis, you see a much larger decrease in total fat mass. Now, it could simply be, uh, it could be that an increased fat, uh, sorry, increased brown fat metabolic activity, maybe that's using the energy stored in fat. Maybe that's the weight loss phenomenon. Maybe that's what we want to induce in overweight individuals. Or maybe this is permissive. Maybe there's some other mechanism and the body says, okay, if you are generating this much heat, I don't need to hold on to this extra tissue. Maybe there's something else unrelated. You can't tell for sure from this figure. But we have a nice, robust reduction in overall fat mass and a corresponding increase in brown adipose activity. And we can see it. We can see the increase in brown adipose activity. And I'm not sure if you have this slide in your notes. I might have added it to, uh, to illustrate the point. This is from that original uh, study with the, the four-week protocol. And this is radio-labeled glucose. And wherever you see these really light areas, these bleached areas, are areas where there is a large amount of glucose uptake. And initially, we see the brain uses a lot of glucose and very little in the torso. A few spots here in the upper back by C7, but then as um, the acclimation protocol carries through after four weeks, you see this, this large induction of glucose uptake near the spine, around the pelvis, still in the brain, the shoulders, the, the scapula. And we think that's an induction of brown fat. Brown fat taking up this glucose to metabolize it and use it for energy. Much greater up to, uh, uptake post-acclimatization than, than before. So we can see an, an increase in substrate being taken up. We can see an increase in the metabolic rate of that tissue and a corresponding decrease in fat mass, all in response to repeated cold exposure. So we're painting a pretty nice picture from a diet and lifestyle weight loss point of view, but maybe that won't be so well tolerated considering the extremes of exposure that you need to go to. And we'll have a nice video at the end of class that um, typifies the, the outer limits of those extremes. And so in trying to understand this a bit more, we have an increase in the activity of brown adipose tissue, but at the whole body level, what does that mean? Can we measure any changes at the whole body level? And we can. This is a robust change in response to cold exposure. We call it cold-induced thermogenesis. If you observe exposure to the cold in individuals at baseline, there's no real effect of the cold, depending on who you look at. But then after repeated exposure, this is extra energy being used only due to the exposure in the cold. So cold-induced thermogenesis uses, in this case, 200 more kcals per day as a result of that direct exposure. So if you were to stay in a cold environment on a daily basis for a long period of time, you could leverage this increase in metabolic rate. That's what this is. This is extra energy expended uh, on top of your resting metabolic rate because of exposure to the cold. The downside is that there's no difference in warm or neutral environments. 
So you go through all this trouble to adapt to the cold. And if you are in a cold situation, energy expenditure goes up. But if you're in a normal situation, no difference. There's no change in metabolic rate. You have to be in that stressed environment to reap these benefits. And maybe in that case, it's not so much of a benefit as it is a countermeasure to stave off the uh, persistent cold exposure. Well, it would be nice, well, one, it would be nice if we could observe changes in a neutral environment. And it would be nice if it didn't take four to six weeks to observe this change. How little exposure is required to see an induction of cold-induced thermogenesis? How little exposure is required to see brown adipose activity ramp up? And for that matter, these have all been in healthy individuals. What about in, in overweight individuals? If we want to use this as a therapy, can we observe the same kind of response in obese individuals? And here we can. So these are obese individuals after only 10 days of cold acclimation. <coughs> Baseline and day 10, left and right, in all cases. So there's multiple panels. And maybe it's easiest to look just at panel B to start. This is the same figure, the uh, glucose uptake figure, as we saw before, but it's black and white. It's not white and uh, red and, and yellow and orange. So the darker areas are those areas that are taking up more glucose, and you can see again, around the spine, more uptake of that substrate. Different kind of, uh, of assessment shown here, looking down from the top. Similar induction of the uh, glucose uptake in that brown fat, these darker red stained areas. So we have more uptake which correlates with a greater activity of brown fat and, again, an increase in metabolic rate in response to the cold. This is um, a slightly different number. It's not the extra energy on top of normal metabolic rate. This is total <laughs> metabolic rate. If you calculate out 6 kilojoules per minute over the course of the day, it's total metabolic rate, and we see that go up in the cold, just like in the healthy individuals after 6 weeks. I think is really interesting is that these obese subjects show a response before anything happens. Isn't that interesting? It took six weeks of acclimation for healthy individuals to show cold-induced thermogenesis. But these obese individuals demonstrate a higher metabolic rate in the cold from day one. So maybe, it's hard to know from these results, but you, can, you can pose a few theories, maybe obese individuals are just more responsive for some reason to cold as a stress. I think it's more likely that perhaps being obese, there is a larger fat mass and that having a larger fat mass, fat mass might also mean that you necessarily have a higher brown fat mass to start. And that might explain this small difference at baseline. But otherwise, I'm hard-pressed to come up with a, a conclusion or an explanation for that. They might just have more existing brown fat to start with. which sort of begs the question, is brown fat to be used as a therapy if they already have more? But we'll leave that for a different course. Even still, 10 days is quick. A lot better than four weeks or six weeks. But the cold exposure that we're talking about here is uncomfortable. Can we ever leverage a more modest cold exposure? And this study set out to answer that question. 
instead of using 10 degrees Celsius, two hours every day for, for even 10 days, this is a modest cold exposure of only 19 degrees Celsius. This is what you would experience in an air-conditioned room, 19 degrees. Maybe in your houses now if they're not well insulated like mine is. 19 degrees Celsius is a typical uh, room temperature in a cold situation or when you actively try to cool it with, with air conditioning. And what we're looking at here is the difference in response. Each uh, square is one individual. And I forget which one are men and which one are women. That doesn't matter. I'll show you um, those differences in a second. Each square is one individual, and on the y-axis we're looking at the difference between their energy expenditure at 24 degrees and their energy expenditure at 19 degrees. So the difference between these two, if the uh, symbol is above this line, it means that their energy expenditure at 19 degrees was larger than energy expenditure at 24 degrees. That makes sense. Right? Final minus initial, the difference between these two, these are a positive number, energy expenditure is greater in the cold, and maybe this should have been shaded blue, greater in the cold above that line. And so, um, in contrast, anything below the line is lower at 19 degrees. You see right away the large majority are above this line. So exposure to 19 degrees caused an increased energy expenditure in the large majority of individuals than you'd observe at 24 degrees. And this is one single day. It's not shown on here, but this is a, a really interesting paradigm where you bring a subject into the lab and you have one room that they live in for a day. And that room is set to either 19 degrees or 24 degrees, and they have a bed, and they have a TV, and they have a sink, and there's food that's delivered to them, but they're contained in a jail, essentially, for a day's time. What's really neat about this kind of study, these rooms are specialized to be accurate as far as temperature, but they are also room calorimeters. So when you're over in the lab and you wear the mask, we're measuring all the air that you breathe out, you have to wear this mask and it's fairly cumbersome. This room is a giant mask. All of the air coming out of the room is analyzed in the same way that you would do it with the metabolic cart. And it's sealed. Nothing can escape other than through the specialized vents that go to the metabolic cart. And so these energy expenditure readings are whole body. They are over the course of an entire day. It's not an hour that's multiplied by 24. They're using all the, the information from that subject, the activity they normally do, how much they sleep. It's continuous measurement. So this is really robust and accurate data, which I think is pretty cool. All told, a day in, 19 degree, in a 19 degree room increased energy expenditure by 5%-ish. After the, uh, the room exposure, they did a very similar uh, brown adipose activity assay. They found it went up by 10% overall. What was really interesting from an energy expenditure point of view is that women responded better than men did. If you separated out women versus men, women tended to have a 10-ish percent increase in energy expenditure, and men only about a, a two and a half to three percent. And we're not immediately sure why that is. A number of reasons could exist. We're not going to speculate too much right now, but either way, pretty nice that one day in a reasonable cold environment can cause this kind of uh, change in energy expenditure. This gives us a good, um, gives us hope that it might be used as a therapy sometime in future.
So energy expenditure is one thing. If you're always in the cold, you want higher energy expenditure to stay warm. This is what um, increases metabolic rate and heat production. Fantastic. Maybe we can leverage this as a therapy to waste energy and lose weight. <coughs> we might also be able to use it as a surrogate or a boost for the normal exercise response. And don't worry so much about the alphabet soup or the, uh, the names down at the bottom. These are just molecular targets in the cell that might be potential therapies. These are things that you might try to target and turn on with a drug or with a certain type of exercise protocol or a certain environmental stress. Irisin is a fascinating molecule. and We're not going to get into it here because it's pretty detailed. Uh, but it's one thing that commonly responds to exercise and to cold. And so we think cold exposure induces some changes in the cell that make white adipose transition to brown. And we've seen that in the past few slides. Cold exposure, if it's extreme, might result in shivering, which is a form of muscle contraction, a loose asynchronous exercise, if you will. That can bolster these responses, enhance those, uh, those signals. And maybe exercise itself can do something similar. So is it possible that exercise could prepare you for cold exposure by inducing some of these changes and increasing brown adipose activity or brown adipose volume in the body? How much do they overlap is what I'm going to look at next. We see oddly parallel changes in um, some of these markers. And I shouldn't have made a point to say we're not going to go too in-depth. This is the only slide I have that uses blots and bands and has uh, molecular things up here. But they're not foreign particles. They're not foreign molecules. We've seen these before. Remember UCP1? That's the thing that disengages the gradient. PGC1, I made a mention last, uh, last class. It's the global coordinator. This is the thing that turns on when you train. The thing that turns on when you exercise. And we think it's really important in, uh, in mediating those changes to exercise. Here, what we're looking at is not exercise but the cold. How is it that cold increases glucose uptake? How is it that cold causes the beijing of fat? How is it that cold increases energy expenditure? Well, in mice, this isn't in humans, 3 and 12 hours of cold exposure turn on PGC1 and turn on UCPs, the uncoupling proteins. These things are like exercise responses. These are probably the ingredients in the soup, the ingredients in the recipe that cause fat to beige, that cause energy expenditure to go up. And it's very similar to what we see in a muscle with exercise. Where we were looking at fat before, and we see brown fat become more active, but no real changes yet in white fat or liver, which shouldn't change. Liver is a, a control tissue. We see the same thing in muscle cells with exercise. This is what happens to exercise. Uh, sorry, this is what happens to the muscle when we exercise. We see PGC1 is activated. And then I don't know if you're, uh, you're familiar with cytochrome oxidase or cytochrome C. Forget what they mean and just assume that it means mitochondrial volume or mitochondrial activity. One of the hallmarks of training is that the mitochondria uh, get better at doing their jobs. And these two proteins are things that allow the mitochondria to do their jobs. So when you exercise and PGC1 is there, both of those things go up. 
So if we can unify this, it seems as though cold exposure turns on this global regulator. This global regulator in fat might also turn up the mitochondria. That's what we see happening in muscle, so why wouldn't it also happen in fat? By making the mitochondria more active and by turning on the uncoupling protein, we have more active mitochondria that waste the work that they do. And it's possible that that change results in whole body increases in energy expenditure. So these are the building blocks for the whole body measurements that we saw on the last few slides. If we can summarize it graphically, this is what we think happens as a result of this global coordinating protein, PGC1-alpha. Fat tissue that normally stores this large glob of triglycerides starts to also include more mitochondria, and you'll see that the, uh, the, fat, the, the amount of fat stored goes down. More metabolically active fat tissue. There's a whole host of research that looks at muscle responses, which we haven't really touched on yet, but muscle becomes more oxidative, has a higher endurance, and becomes more trained whenever PGC1 is turned on. And while we often leave liver by the wayside and never really talk about it, there's a role for PGC1 to make the liver more resistant to fasting as a stretch, or when you uh, engage in fasting for PGC1 to be activated and do a, a whole host of good things in the liver. We're going to leave it at that, but it gets rid of fatty liver and helps to rejuvenate the liver. This is not unlike why a lot of people recommend doing dry January after big New Year's to rejuvenate the liver um, through mechanisms like this. So similar effects, more beneficial, more functional tissues whenever PGC1 is around. And we think that the way cold activates this is through direct activation of the nervous system. And I hesitate to go into too much detail with these slides, but we'll just say the nervous system turns on and then a cascade of events occurs. A cascade of proteins are produced that cause uh, muscle fibers to become more resilient, that turn on oxidation of the mitochondria, that also turn up UCP1 on the other slides, any of those proteins that deal with the beijing of brown fat. Cold turns on the sympathetic nervous system, which activates a cascade of events. And notice PGC1 is involved in all of them. So we're getting a little bit molecular, and that's only because I really like the molecular aspects, um, but I don't want to go into too much detail. Is anything about the message unclear? Sympathetic nervous system is turned on directly in response to cold, and then this cascade of events involving PGC1 makes all of this good stuff happen. All right, still fairly early. Let's digest this quickly, though. Take a five-minute break, and then we've got some um, some videos to watch, or at least one video. To